Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. New on the night beat, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Frank Pomeroy, gave his last sermon during Sunday service today. This comes as the church approaches the five year anniversary of the mass shooting that took the lives of 26 congregants. The night team's Alyssa Cole spoke with Pastor Pomeroy about his new calling, as well as the broken community he helped heal through faith. I think the church will move forward, continuing to meet the needs of the community and hopefully uh, uh, reaching out and bringing more community in. Embracing what's next, Pastor Frank Pomeroy set the tone Sunday morning as he gave his final sermon as the head pastor of First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, bringing his 20 plus years of pastorship to a close. He leaves having done what a servant should always do, keeping his flock together at all times, even in the midst of unimaginable evil and indescribable pain. Associate Pastor Ray Warren says he met Pastor Frank after the 2017 tragedy. He says Pomeroy's strength brought the church and community closer. To be able to lead through that kind of mayhem and losing a family member yourself and continue to lead shows a whole lot of integrity. And that's what I'm going to miss about his leadership is his truthfulness. Brittany Martinez tells us she's been a member for about 20 years. While she says she will openly welcome future leadership, she believes Pastor Frank's contributions will always have a lasting impact. They've really been through it with us. It's not like we put them on a pedestal. They give more than what they even have. They're truly amazing people and they will really be missed. We asked Pastor Frank what he and his wife plan to do next. We don't know exactly. I know God has called us to speak in several different places and uh, uh, maybe even in a, a campground type ministry, one on one ministry. We really don't know. It's like Abraham and Ur. We're just stepping out because he told us to. OK, so, perfect, like you know, missionary. That's right. Okay, Into a local missionary, if you will. Alyssa Cole, Case at 12 News. So the news we're following this Sunday, a deadly crash forces deputies to shut down a portion of Highway 90 this morning. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says they were called out to Highway 90 and Meckler Road in far west Bear County just after 730 for a one vehicle crash there. Deputies say that vehicle crashed into a pole. We're told the impact of that crash so powerful it split that vehicle in half. Deputies say one person died. The main lanes of Highway 90 had to be closed for quite some time as they worked to clear the scene. New information tonight, the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has released the names of the driver and passenger killed in that head on crash involving an 18 wheeler Friday morning. Those victims are 21 year old Carmen Corpus and 22 year old Kevin Corpus. The crash happened early Friday around 3 a.m. on Highway 90 near South General McMullen. San Antonio police say a Nissan crashed directly into the 18 wheeler. Both victims were pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators have not released what may have caused the driver to hit the truck. A man who was shot three times was able to make it to his girlfriend's house to call for help. San Antonio police were called to the scene just before midnight on Segura Street near Old Highway 90 and West Commerce Street. They say the man was shot twice in the leg and once in the behind. He was taken to the hospital for treatment. Police say he was unable to tell them the exact location of where that shooting happened. Three people taken to the hospital, one in critical condition, all injured in a rollover crash this morning on Loop 410. This crash happened around 2 a.m. near Jackson Keller Road. Police say one vehicle rolled over on the highway, affecting several other vehicles. Two people inside an SUV were taken to the hospital for minor injuries. A third person in a red car was in critical condition, and a fourth victim was treated at the scene. Right now, the cause of that crash is still unknown. He was gunned down just over a week ago. Now the family of Mark Maldonado pleading for the suspect to come forward. SAPD says Maldonado was killed during a road rage shooting back on September 16th. His family says he was just leaving his mother's house when he was shot while driving on West Commerce near Bellcross Street. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. The family hosting a candlelight vigil in his memory, describing him as friendly and the life of the party. Now they want to tell the world about the kind of person he was in hopes that someone comes forward with some answers. He was always happy. He was uh, he was just a very friendly person. I mean, if you knew him, you loved him. And if you knew him, you were either his brother, his sister, or his cousin, because he made everybody his family. I just hope that this person's conscience eats at him and he comes forward, I hope. 
Take a look at your screen right now. Crime Stoppers releasing this photo of the suspect's vehicle. Anyone with information on this case urged to call Crime Stoppers. Their number 210-224-STOP. You can earn up to $5,000 for any tip that leads to an arrest in this case. You can also remain anonymous. The Bear County Sheriff's Office hoping surveillance photos will lead to the arrest of a burglary suspect. Take a look. Deputies say he allegedly stole a car and used credit cards that were found inside. The car was a Nissan Xterra taken from Bulverde Road back on August 14th. Later, the suspect was allegedly seen making purchases using the stolen credit cards at a quick trip and a Target, both located on Fredericksburg Road. The car has since been recovered by deputies. Anyone with any information asked to call BCSO. Trying to be part of a rap video may have caused three teens to end up with a rap sheet. Multiple calls to 911 about more than a dozen teens waving around guns led police to the 100 block of Dresden off of Blanco Road. When they arrived there, they found a large group of teenagers, several of them holding three handguns and one AR style rifle. Officers instructed the teens to drop the guns and get on the ground. Everyone complied except for a few that took off running. Police detained nine people and several of them had outstanding warrants. SAPD says it turns out the group was trying to make a rap video. Six people were arrested and the other three individuals were released at the scene. This morning, Gold Star Mothers received a special acknowledgement from the city of San Antonio. Joint Base San Antonio Fort Sam Houston hosting a Gold Star Mothers and Family Day. During the ceremony, Mayor Ron Nuremberg presented a proclamation officially declaring September 25th as Gold Star Mothers and Family Day for Military City USA. Service members say it's recognition that is necessary for those who feel the loss every day. This day honors and recognizes the sacrifices that all mothers and family members make when a father, mother, brother, son, daughter dies in service to our nation. Gold Star Mothers and Family Day is celebrated on the last Sunday of September. Now to an update on a story we first told you about on Friday. A local veteran has been reunited with her beloved support dog, Hoochie. The dog and the truck he was inside was stolen from the HEB parking lot on Military Drive and Pleasanton Road on Thursday. Earlier today, someone spotted him wandering down a street about two blocks away from the Alamo Dome. They took a photo and shared it online. Friends of the dog's owner, Karen Lucchesi, a retired military vet and firefighter, came across the post online and immediately picked up Hoochie. We're told tonight. Hucci is in good spirits, but unfortunately, Lucchesi's truck was found at the San Antonio impound lot. Her family tells us she is working with law enforcement to try to recover it. Sweet dog there. Well, it is a big step in a child's life, waiting alone for the bus to take them to school. It may seem inconsequential to adults, but one photographer is hoping to capture it in a new light. And he tells that I team's Lee Waldman. He wants this to inspire adults to do more to protect those young lives. A quiet moment, frozen in time, lit by headlights. You really are waiting for the bus. You know, the bus comes down the road, and then it's all over. And they get on the bus, they drive away, and I go home. Kids waiting for the bus to take them to school. It's something we can easily forget about. But this year in Uvalde, it holds more weight. When you're there at the school, it's just like a few feet. You're a few feet away, and it's just, I mean, it's very powerful. The New Yorker magazine photographer Greg Miller made the trip from Connecticut to capture the innocence of these kids as they head back to school after yeah, tragedy. We don't bring children into the planet to be gunned down. They're here to grow up. The morning bus project isn't new and neither is the message behind it. Miller started it in Newtown at Sandy Hook Elementary. The next Monday, you know, I, I was there with my daughter and I said goodbye to her uh, when she went to school. And, you know, I felt like, is this going to be the last time I see her? 20 children never got the chance to grow up. Six teachers never made it home from work. It turned Miller's world upside down. He looked at the morning bus routine in a new light. If Sandy Hook, the Sandy Hook shooting didn't stop us in our tracks, I mean, if Uvalde didn't stop us in our tracks, like, what will it take? A picture may be worth a thousand words, but Miller hopes it might inspire action to protect our children when they step off the bus. I think we agree that childhood is precious, actually. If we... 
Miller's project is close to being finished. He tells me he'll know when the project will be published within the coming week. Back to you. Thank you for sharing that story, Lee. Happening tomorrow, U.S. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and U.S. Congressman Joaquin Castro will be in Uvalde. They're holding a Congressional Children's Caucus meeting to discuss federal trauma services. It'll all be happening at 2 p.m. at the Southwest Texas Junior College. We've been told each of the families will have five minutes alone with the representatives. All right, taking a look outside with live cam here this Sunday night. Still plenty muggy out across South Central Texas. Temperatures currently sitting in the 80s for a good portion of the area. The first weekend of fall definitely didn't feel like it. It was hot and it was humid, but the good news is we have some changes that are on the way as we see a front move in tomorrow morning. Let's take a look at the Almanac data, though. Earlier today, we had a low of 75, well above the average low of 67 for this time of year. Highs were able to climb into the low to mid 90s, but of course, with the moisture in the atmosphere, it felt just a few degrees warmer. We also did manage a few isolated showers and a couple of thunderstorms, especially west of San Antonio. Antonio. Right now, we just have one lone shower moving into the far northern reaches of Uvalde County, but that front is off to the north, and that is going to be sliding southward through the overnight hours and early tomorrow, bringing in some drier air, which will make for more pleasant weather this week. We'll have all those details coming up in a bit. Coming up, the music plays on. Grassroots orchestras here in San Antonio gaining momentum and showing success is all about hitting the right notes. And KSAT continues to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. Meet Olga Custodio, the first Latina military pilot. Her story of shattering the glass ceiling in more ways than one, inspiring women to aim high. And officials tonight in Florida are sounding the alarm, warning residents to get ready for Tropical Storm Ian as that storm continues to barrel full steam ahead for the Sunshine State. That story straight ahead. Growing concern tonight in Florida, the National Hurricane Center urging people around the Florida Keys and across that peninsula to make hurricane plans. Yeah, Tropical Storm Ian now churning through the Caribbean on its track to reach parts of Florida within just a matter of days. ABC's Justin Finch following the latest. Tonight, Florida under a state of emergency. Be prepared now. Take a look at your plans, know where you're going to go, and how to keep your family safe. Ian is expected to become a major hurricane soon. His path through Florida still uncertain. This man filling sandbags was just in Puerto Rico helping his parents before Fiona hit. And now I'm here helping myself and everybody else that I can. Across Florida, families are now buying plywood, preparing to board up their homes. Cities off the state's west coast at high risk of heavy wind, rain and storm surge. ABC's Rob Marciano. This is Tampa Bay, a massive body of water that spans 30 miles to the Gulf of Mexico, only 11 feet deep with the right wind. That water gets pushed up the bay, piling up until it reaches downtown and has nowhere else to go, flooding the core of the city. In Canada, recovery underway after Fiona made landfall early Saturday. Fiona, now the most powerful storm on record to strike Canada. Its strength sending several buildings into the sea, ripping rooftops from apartments and toppling scores of trees. And tonight, widespread power outages and long lines for gas. You're waiting hours for gas, like just to get generators in your house. Fiona first made landfall in Puerto Rico one week ago. Tonight, more than 600,000 customers there remain without power. Justin Finch, ABC News, Tampa. And we here at KSAT hope you'll join us on our KSAT community partners efforts to help those in Puerto Rico devastated by Hurricane Fiona. Tomorrow we are hosting a phone bank with the American Red Cross. Volunteers from the agency will be accepting donations to help the people of the island country begin to rebuild their lives. It'll be taking place from noon to 7 p.m. 
Those poor folks dealing with another one just five years after another one hit there. Now our eyes are on Florida tonight, hoping no major destruction there from whatever Ian's going to cook up. Yeah, yeah it's not it, looking good, Mia. Exactly. It's going to be something to really keep close eyes on as we head into the upcoming work week. And really, this just goes to show that even after the peak of hurricane season, which was just over two weeks ago, we still do have quite a bit of the season to go through. And we really have seen some of that activity ramp up here over the past couple of weeks, especially in regards to the Atlantic Basin. So let's get you the latest information that we just got in at the top of the hour on Tropical Storm Ian from the forecasters over at the National Hurricane Center. It is still tracking over the warm waters of the Caribbean Sea, and it is expected to strengthen into a hurricane by the end of the day tomorrow. Latest info here from the advisory, 65 mile per hour winds sustained, gusting upwards of 75 miles per hour. It is moving to the northwest now, and it is expected to take more of a northward turn here over the next 24 to 48 hours, potentially passing over or just near the western reaches of Cuba before it then emerges into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico on Tuesday. There it is currently expected to strengthen into a major category three or four hurricane before it then approaches the Sunshine State by about Thursday. So still a lot of details to fine tune on this system here as it gets better organized over the next 48 hours, but a mixture of hurricane warnings, tropical storm warnings, as well as tropical storm watches currently in effect for the western reaches of Cuba, reaching down to the Cayman Islands, and that even does stretch up to the Florida Keys in the southwestern reaches of the peninsula there for high winds, heavy rainfall, dangerous storm surge, all things to monitor with that system. Again, no threat to us here in the state of Texas, but definitely Definitely something to monitor for our friends and family out that way. Back here at home, we did manage to find some spotty showers, a couple of isolated thunderstorms across the western reaches of south central Texas earlier this afternoon and evening. As of this hour, most of us are quiet. We do have just a few little showers moving across 83 there in northern Uvalde County near Concan. That will continue to move farther down to the south as well as the west. Temperature wise, we're in the 70s and 80s across the region, 85 in San Antonio. Antonio 81 in Pleasanton at 76 out in Uvalde this hour. Take a look farther up to the north, especially in Amarillo. Temperatures tonight in the mid 60s. Now we will start to see some relief in those temperatures, especially in the mornings over the next several days, all thanks to that front that's going to slide through the state here over the next 24 hours. But really the biggest benefit we will get from the passage of this boundary is drier air. Those dew points are expected to fall throughout the day tomorrow and really those lower humidity values will stick with us throughout the majority of the upcoming work week, which means it's going to be a whole lot more comfortable out there when you do step outdoors. So again, we will see this front move through through the overnight hours. It approaches South Central Texas, then it moves through our region throughout the morning and into the Monday afternoon time frame. It's possible we find a couple of isolated showers tomorrow morning. Morning. Better chances of finding that across the hill country, about a 10% chance here in San Antonio. And then tomorrow afternoon can't completely rule out a few additional isolated spots of rain in our southwestern counties. Overall coverage isn't expected to be pretty great. We will wake up in the upper 60s, low 70s. Those temperatures still pretty warm out there into the afternoons, low to mid 90s. But here's the thing with that drier air moving in, at least those heat index values really won't be that different from the actual air temperature. So good Good news there into the lunchtime hour upper 80s. We transition to the low to mid 90s again. Likely will be a little breezy as we see those winds flip in from the north. Some wind gusts upwards of 20 to 25 miles per hour possible. And then take a look at that seven day beautiful conditions. Plenty of sunshine lows in the 60s transitioning to about 90. A little taste of fall finally moving into the area. I might cry. Tearing up a little bit. I might cry seeing the Just 60s. in time for the skeletons. I took them out of the closet today. <laughs> there and, uh, you go. I'll be sweating with them a little bit tomorrow. <laughs> All right, Greg has a preview of Instant Replay right after this. Will Michael Gallup make his return to the Dallas Cowboys tomorrow night when they face the Giants in a big Monday night football matchup? With more on that, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. And you can see that game live on KSAT 12 yes. starting tomorrow at 715. And the Houston Texans are still looking for their first win of the season after another four-quarter collapse. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay.
Um, this is an important game. It's a division game. It's our first division game. Uh, it's Monday Night Football. You know, they're 2-0. You know, at the end of the day, this is going to come down to us, us playing our, you know, our play style. All right, when the Dallas Cowboys face the Giants in New York tomorrow night, everyone is wondering if wide receiver Michael Gallup makes his return to the starting lineup after undergoing off-season surgery repair at torn interior Kruschek ligament. And if he does, will that lead to a victory with the Giants only one-point favorites? Starting to rain at Soldier Field on third and one. Mills pass deflected, intercepted! Another fourth-quarter failure as the Houston Texans fall to the Bears in Chicago today after quarterback Davis Mills gives up a late interception that leads to the game-winning field goal. What does he have to say for himself? And are the San Antonio Spurs in for a rough season after their new face of the franchise, Keldon Johnson, is injured before training camp even tips off tomorrow? Sports guys are back tonight with their opinions. All that plus UTSA rolls into Conference USA play after a big win over Texas Southern. And who wins tomorrow night between the Cowboys and the Giants tonight? You decide. Instant replay is live and it's right after the night beat. A lot to talk about as yeah, always. Looking forward to it. All right, Greg, we'll see you again in just a little bit. Still ahead on the night beat, they have been around but gaining newfound attention. Learn about the grassroots symphonies growing in popularity after the closure of the San Antonio Symphony. And Russia's president looking to draft. Meanwhile, some Russians are looking to protest. The latest move in Russia to keep the war in Ukraine a fight for them to win. Well, Russia is aggressively implementing a military draft that's now inciting violent demonstrations while hundreds of men who are potential soldiers flee the country. This while Vladimir Putin moves ahead with plans to annex parts of Ukraine, possibly as soon as the end of this week. ABC's M. Wynn with the latest. Demonstrations against Russian President Vladimir Putin's military draft are growing. More than 700 protesters arrested across more than 30 Russian cities, according to the human rights activists. And what you are seeing in the streets right now is a deep unhappiness with what Putin is doing. Along Russia's border, long lines of men trying to leave as Putin's military draft goes into effect. That's a mobilization of more than 300,000 reservists with military expertise. When Putin has his speech, uh, I just pack my bag. Putin signed a new law with amendments to the Russian criminal code, upping the punishments for crimes of desertion, looting and surrender during periods of mobilization and martial law, according to the official portal of legal information. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on this week, stressing it's too soon to tell if Putin's control over Russia is falling and saying if Putin were to follow through on his nuclear weapons threats, there would be a decisive response from the U.S. We've been been careful in how we talk about this publicly because from our perspective we want to lay down the principle that there would be catastrophic consequences but not engage in a game of rhetorical tit for tat. Meanwhile Russia is pushing ahead with what the U.S. is calling sham referendums in Russian controlled parts of Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky telling CBS's Face the Nation Putin is looking to annex these Ukrainian regions because he knows he's losing the war. It's seven months since Russia occupied tried to occupy Ukraine, but they couldn't. And now he has to justify. He has to take steps to justify. Russian state media suggesting Russia could annex those regions as early as Friday, with Russia's foreign minister saying those annexed regions will be given full protection. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. Back here at home, it was a good day to play in the streets. No, really. Streets in and around downtown San Antonio shut down to allow people to get back outside and have some fun. Ciclovia was held today and people took full of the empty, took full advantage. That's the word. Thank you. Full advantage of the streets being empty. The annual event provides a safe place, biking, skating and walking pets. Organizers say getting outside can help people's physical and mental health. I think people are suffering from not being out and about, socializing, um, depression is big, and so I encourage everybody just to get out, get out in the sun, get out with your community, make some friends. Now, if you miss participating in today's event, no need to worry, the next one is scheduled for March. Well, when the San Antonio Symphony dissolved earlier this year, a void was left in our South Texas performing arts scene. But the musicians of the symphony refused to stay silent and in the process are influencing some small grassroots orchestras around the San Antonio area. The night team's Patty Santos introduces us to two orchestras that prove the key to success 
is in the delivery. I just really love playing with a group. Like there's not, I don't really have as much motivation to just play on my own for, I mean, for myself, I guess. Veda Corso and 70 members with the South Texas Symphonic Orchestra love playing at auditoriums across the area. We come together and it's kind of like, here's this thing that we've just put our hearts like, sweat and tears like our heart in it so just something for them to enjoy and experience artistic director ronnie sanders started the nonprofit five years ago aiming to draw high caliber musicians to form a professional level orchestra to play it for free we are driven by the passion and the emotion and the beauty of music most of our concerts are absolutely free we want Anybody who wants to hear an orchestra come without any problem with ticket prices. The symphony has slowly gained notoriety and a following. On this night, they're practicing for the fall season. In Seguin, the Mid-Texas Symphony is a full professional orchestra. They also perform in New Braunfels and they're slowly stretching their music impact and reach. Sure, we are actually uh, progressing towards a, 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 a very prominent regional professional orchestra in, in, in Central Texas. With an annual budget of $425,000, the 45-year-old organization employs just over 70 members. We are grassroots and uh, we're small but mighty um, as an organization, and um, our communities are smaller, uh, but growing um, by percentage, really amazingly. Soon, they'll be expanding further into Valverde. Over the years, we have uh, been the leading arts organization in our area that provides not just quality artistic, inter you know, concerts or, you know, quality concerts, but uh, uh, the leading educational outreach program for 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 students to come and watch uh, music uh, free of charge to their to their schools. The goal for both. All right, taking a look outside with live cam here again this Sunday night. It's a little muggy still. Temperatures in the 80s for most of us. It was a muggy start. It was a humid finish, and it definitely was hot out there as well. We had partly cloudy skies across the majority of the area. Time lapse view, though, shows plenty of peaks of sunshine as well as blue skies helping those temperatures warm again. Mid 90s here in San Antonio earlier this afternoon. We still have moisture in place, but that front does move in tomorrow and we will see more of that drier air filter into South Central Texas, which means it will start to feel a whole lot better out there. If you like these afternoon highs closer to the upper 80s and low 90s instead of the mid 90s with the heat index value, you are really going to like those morning lows. We'll talk all about it and get you another look at the tropics coming up here in just a few. Determined to become a pilot in the military despite barriers to discourage women. How this proud Latina was able to make her dream take flight and become a pioneer in the process. An aviation pioneer is being honored during this Hispanic Heritage Month. Olga Custodio is the first Latina military pilot and the Hispanic Heritage Foundation is recognizing her work. Now retired, Custodio lives right here in Military City, USA. She sat down with our Erica Hernandez to talk about her career and how her desire to fly allowed her to serve her country and become a hero in more ways than one. Born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Olga Custodio knew early on about life in the military. Her father was in the Army. Served in the latter part of the World War II, then he went back to uh, enlist again and um, went to the Korean War. After working at Puerto Rican International Airlines and graduating college, Olga wanted to serve just like her father. But at first, being a pilot wasn't a possibility. It wasn't the goal because it wasn't available. After being told she couldn't serve as an officer, Olga kept trying. And eventually in 1980, she was accepted into officer training school and then pilot training. In 1981, she got her Air Force wings. To do something that women were just starting to be able to do, they were given that opportunity and I was part of that pioneer group. Olga would become the first Latina military fighter pilot. She flew numerous types of military aircraft and became an instructor pilot. Olga would also become one of the first American Airlines Latina commercial pilots. 
I was not in this to be the first of anything, you know. When it happens organically, it's just meant to be. Olga has since retired here in San Antonio. A few months ago, she found out her more than 40 years in aviation would be honored by the Hispanic Heritage Foundation with the Hispanic Heritage STEM Award, an award she hopes will help further inspire future pilots. I have a mantra, motto, that I use. It's querer es poder, where there's a will, there's power, the power's within you. You can find that, tap it, and use it to, to excel and succeed. The Hispanic Heritage Awards will take place on September 30th. It will air on PBS. Other nominees this year include Daddy Yankee, Los Lobos, and Marvel Studios' Victoria Alonso. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Inspiring, thank you so much for your service. All right, well this time tomorrow, the sky will be offering a possible glimpse of a famous celestial body with a well-known red spot. How you can get the best view after the break. All right, check this out, stargazing fans. Something special is gonna be happening in the sky tomorrow night. Jupiter will be closer than usual to Earth. According to NASA, this will be the nearest, the largest planet in the solar system has been to Earth in nearly six decades. So close, scientists say it'll be appear bigger and brighter because it will only be 367 million miles away, Tim. Only? That's it. That's close. That's almost half the distance, though, that the planet is from the Earth at its farthest. So experts say the best place to get the view of Jupiter on Monday will be a high elevated spot in a dark and dry area, maybe like up in the hill country? Well, the question is, will there be any clouds out there Ooh. to prevent us from seeing this cool sun? I know who to ask. Me too. <gasps> there you go. That's it. Okay, <laughs> so good thing is, is that skies should be pretty clear uh, as good. we start to see that drier air move in behind the passage of that cold front that moves through south central Texas throughout the morning hours tomorrow. But yes, let's get you a little forecast personalized for the Jupiter in opposition event happening in the south central sky tomorrow. So yes, it's going to be close to Earth, but it's also going to be positioned opposite of the sun, which is why it's also going to be so bright in the night sky. Now it's going to rise on the eastern horizon right after sunset at about 740 p.m. It should in theory be visible throughout the entirety of the night tomorrow and then it sets before the sun comes up Tuesday morning around 710. So again, it will probably be still pretty breezy out there tomorrow evening if you are going to step outside and try and catch a glimpse, but we should have mostly clear skies in place, so that is good as well. Temperatures just shy of 90 by 7 p.m. We see those temperatures fall into the low 80s by 9 and then into the 70s before we head into the early morning hours of our Tuesday. And again, those clearing skies once again made possible thanks to that drier air that's going to be moving in behind the front. Again, we do still have a couple of isolated showers across the western reaches of the area stretching up into the Edwards Plateau, a little cluster of showers in between San Angelo, as well as I-35 this hour as we continue to see that boundary work its way farther southbound. I do think it's possible that we find a few isolated showers, especially west of San Antonio in the hill country before the sun comes up tomorrow morning. We've got a 10% chance for a stray splash of rain or two here in town and in Bear County tomorrow as we actually see that front move through. And then a 20% chance across our southwestern counties tomorrow afternoon as that boundary continues to work through the southern regions of south central Texas. So all things to monitor, but overall coverage should be pretty low with that front. Now we see those humidity values drop throughout the day via that breezy north wind that is moving in as the boundary does move through. Still is going to be a muggy start first thing Monday morning, upper 60s in store across the hill country, low 70s for the central, eastern, and southern reaches of the area, and it's still going to be plenty warm into the afternoon. Upper 80s across the hill country, around 93 to 94 here in San Antonio. A little bit warmer the farther south you go, where it just takes a little bit longer for that front to make it to you. But again, that heat index value not going to be as much of a factor for your Monday afternoon. We're in the upper 80s by lunch.
lunchtime here in town. Low 90s tomorrow afternoon and then upper 70s as we head into tomorrow evening. Now it is still going to be breezy again. Some wind gusts generally upwards of 20, 25 miles per hour, certainly possible. And that is just going to filter in more of that drier air. We're really going to feel the benefit of that in the mornings, especially Thursday and Friday here in town, waking up to morning lows below average in the low 60s. That's just fantastic. Not as oppressive when you step outside greeted by all of that humidity. We're not going to find that to buy the middle to later portions of the upcoming week, especially and then into the afternoons still warm upper 80s, low 90s, but definitely a lot better than the mid 90s with the heat index value. So that is definitely the good news there again. A little taste of fall in the works here this week. Again, just a quick little update on tropical storm and that continues to move to the north across the Caribbean Sea. It is expected to strengthen into a hurricane tomorrow pass across or near the western reaches of Cuba tomorrow night and into early Tuesday before it emerges into the southeastern Gulf. Potentially some big impacts there to Florida, so we will continue to keep eyes on that. No issues for us here at home. We're getting a little breezy tomorrow. A couple showers certainly possible, but the rest of the week looking fantastic. You know what that means, Mia? What does it mean? We're teaching you as we go. It's our first spooky season. That means Tim's climbing the ladder on his house and starting <laughs> to set up a skeleton. I can't wait. Mm. Oh. Updates to come, I'm sure. Always. I need observation. Fortunately, <laughs> the wife will be working from home tomorrow. <laughs> All right, another film dethrones the woman king at the box office this weekend. The movie that took that top spot, I'll tell you next. If only they would just die. Pearl, starring Mia Goth, fell to fifth place, earning $1.9 million. The horror film Barbarian made $4.8 million, landing in fourth place. The re-release of Avatar brought in $10 million, enough for a third place finish. Some things are worth fighting for. The Woman King failed to hold on to its crown, falling to second place with $11.1 million. Here you can live the life you deserve. Whether because of or in spite of all the bad press, Don't Worry Darling debuted number one, collecting $19.2 million in its opening weekend. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. The UTSA Roadrunners kick off Conference USA play this Saturday after a big win over Texas Southern. And district games open for most high school football teams as we get ready to start the second half of the season. I can't even believe it already. Let's head over to Greg's. <laughs> Neither can I. I know. We're right in the middle of it, right? And San Antonio FC is a team to beat as they come close to the United Soccer League playoffs. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Wow, quarterback Frank Harris and wide receiver DeCorian Clark broke school records in UTSA Roadrunners' huge 52-24 victory over Texas Southern. Harris in passing yards at 392, Clark on receiving yards at 217 and three touchdowns. And San Antonio FC is the team to beat in the West in the United Soccer League thanks to their latest victory that has earned them the top spot with three games to go. The second half of the high school football season is set to kick off this week with many teams such as number one ranked Steel set to open district play while others are already deep in the games that count towards the playoffs. We will show you in the best of big game coverage and an all new 12's top 12, sub 5A 12's top 12 as well. All that plus will Michael Gallup make his 2022 debut for the Cowboys against the Giants on Monday Night Football. And do you agree with the year long suspension for former Spurs assistant Emmy Udoka for violating team rules in Boston? The Sports Guys debate instant replay is live and it is next. That'll be an interesting debate. Yes, it will. All right, Greg, we'll see you in just a little bit. And we'll see you after the break. Let's finish off with something good. Most of us learn what we do and do not like at an early age, but some researchers believe we may develop traits while we're actually in the womb. I have heard this. According to a new study published in the journal Psychological Science, your taste buds may develop before you're even born. Scientists at Durham University in the UK 
conducted a study giving 100 pregnant women either a carrot pill, a kale pill, or a placebo. They then took images of their fetuses 20 minutes later to see their reaction. You don't have to be a scientist to see. The sweet carrot flavor got more smiles, and the bitter kale got some big frowns. I was definitely the B picture there. <laughs> Researchers are hoping to learn if tweaking a pregnant woman's diet could help promote healthy eating habits later in life for children. All I ate was oranges, and I, she does I love that oranges. face right there. That's great. <laughs> That's all of our time for now. For all of us here at KSAT 12, thanks for watching. Be sure to tune in to Good Morning San Antonio for all your latest overnight news. And all new instant replay starts right now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. When the Dallas Cowboys face the New York Giants on Monday Night Football tomorrow night, live here on KSAT 12, there'll be one-point underdogs. Cooper Rush will be trying to go 3-0 and as a starting quarterback as Dak Prescott continues to recover from his surgery on his throwing hand after fracturing the bone below his right thumb. But that's not the biggest question for game day. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The biggest question is whether or not Michael Gallup will make his return after the Cowboys wide receiver was listed as questionable for tomorrow night's game. The showdown is always good, and it's the New York football Giants coming into this game with a 2-0 record. Dallas comes into this game 1-1 one one record, while the Giants are undefeated, winning their first two games by a total of just four points. First, they started the season by beating the Titans on the road 21-20. Then last weekend, they won at home against the Panthers 19-16, while the Cowboys continue to keep their ship afloat with Cooper Rush at quarterback. Now is the time for the Cowboys' running game to attack. Both teams have given up very similar yards on the ground to their opponents, and neither team has given up a rushing touchdown. So what has Zeke seen when scouting the Giants' defense this week? You know, I mean, I think I think on film you can visually see that, you know, they're, they're playing a little harder as a defense uh, th this year. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's a little bit different scheme. Uh, you know, they bring a lot of pressures. A lot of sometimes, you know, it's not that fundamentally sound, but uh, you definitely got to be locked in on, on the different uh, pressures they bring. So here's what both running backs have done so far in this season with only two games under their belt. Elliott has 25 carries, Pollard with 15, 105 yards total for Zeke, 51 for Pollard, 4.2 averaging out, 3.4 likewise. No touchdowns for Zeke, one for Tony Pollard, and a total another re receiving yards, negative seven for Zeke, 69 total for Pollard. So up next, the Giants of Monday Night Football live on KSI 12 starting tomorrow night at 7.15. Two similar teams facing each other today at Soldier Field, the winless Texans and the 101 Chicago Bears. Bears up early, 3-0, adding more on their second drive. Khalil Herbert goes into the end zone from 11 yards out. It's 10-0 Bears. Texans respond. Davis Mills finds Jordan Atkins from the back of the end zone for the four-yard touchdown. Bears are up 10-7 after one. Second quarter now, Damian Pierce gets his first NFL touchdown on this one-yard score. Texans retake the lead, though, 14-10, would lead 14-13 at halftime. Third quarter now, Texans up 17-13 when Herbert scores again for Chicago, this time from a yard out. It's 20-17, the Bears. We would be tied at 20 with less than two minutes to play when the Texans are driving Mills Rose, but the ball is tipped, picked off by Roquan Smith deep in Texans territory. That sets up Cairo Santos. He makes his third field goal of the day. This one, the game winner from 30 yards out. The Bears racked up 281 yards rushing, the most they have had since 1984. Houston has been outscored 30 to nothing in the fourth quarter this season. Here is your final score. Not pretty again, 23 to 20. Houston now is 0-2 and 1 with that one tie. After the game, Davis Mills took us through the game-changing interception. Had Rex open um, and just the ball got tipped to the line. Nothing I can really do about it there. Um, good play by the defense. Um, just unfortunate. Down in the red zone, too. Um, turn the ball over. Uh, and an opportunity we can go down and score a touchdown. Uh, at this point, I mean, we got to take advantage of all those opportunities. Um, scoring touchdowns rather than kicking field goals or turning the ball over. It's tough. Yeah, you got that right. Los Angeles Chargers now come calling at noon on in Houston, NRG Stadium. Bills at Dolphins, the only two undefeated teams facing each other today. A fourth quarter, Bills by three when Chase Edmonds scores a three-yard touchdown run. Miami's up 21-17, under two minutes to play. Dolphins punter Thomas Morstead tries to kick out of the end zone, but the kick 
hit blocker Trent Sherfield in the hind side. The ball goes backwards out of bounds to the safety. Bills get the two points, but that's as close as they would get. Fish win a 2019, improved to 3 0. Packers and Buccaneers, 14 6 Packers. Tom Brady finds Russell Gage for the one yard touchdown with 14 seconds left. Bucks deciding to go for the two point conversion to tie the game, but Brady's pass intended for Gage again is incomplete. Packers win 14 12. Both teams are 2 1. Rodgers had two touchdown passes today. Chiefs and Colts. Kansas City was up 17 10 before Indy scored 10 straight points, including this 12-yard touchdown pass from Matt Ryan to Jelani Woods for 12 yards out. Less than 30 seconds to play. Colts upset KC 20-17. Lions and Vikings. Lions were up by 10 in the fourth quarter when the Vikings scored two touchdowns, including this 28-yard TD pass from Kirk Cousins to K.J. Osborne with 45 seconds left. Vikings win at 28-24. Eagles at Commanders. Carson Wentz hoping to play well against his former team, but this is all Jalen Hurts. He was 22-35, 340 yards, three touchdowns, all to different receivers in the second quarter. Wentz was sacked nine Nine times today, Philly takes it 24 to 8, improved to 3 and 0. Oh. Ravens and Patriots. This game belonged to Lamar Jackson. He had 218 yards, four touchdowns, two of them to Mark Andrews. Jackson also rushed for 107 yards, scored another touchdown. Ravens win at 37-26. Saints at Panthers. Four quarter. Baker Mayfield finds Lavisca Chenault Jr. for the 67-yard touchdown. Panthers never look back. They win at 22 to 14. Jaguars and Chargers. Trevor Lawrence had 262 yards passing, three touchdowns today. James Robinson rushed for 100 yards, another touchdown. Jags win at 38 to 10. They're in first place in the AFC South. Rams and Cardinals. Kyler Murray had 314 yards passing, but Arizona could only come up with four field goals. The Rams, on the other hand, 100 yards rushing here as a team and two touchdowns. And by Cam Akers, one by Cooper Cup. Rams win at 20 to 12. Falcons and Seahawks. Cordero Patterson had 17 carries, 141 yards rushing, one touchdown. Marcus Mariota had 229 yards passing of the touchdown. Falcons win their first game 27-23. Bengals at the Jets end of the first quarter. Joe Burrow finds Tyler Boyd, who spins out between two defenders and takes off for the 56 yards touchdown. Burrow had three TD passes today since he wins it 27-12. to The winless Raiders taking on the winless Titans. And the Tennessee never trailed in this one. Ryan Tannehill threw for 264 yards. He ran in for another. Derrick Henry added 85 yards rushing and a touchdown. Titans win at 24-22. 40 Niners at Broncos tonight. Late four quarter, 10 to 5 Niners. When Melvin Gordon, the second, scores him a yard out. Two point conversion, no good. The Broncos led 11 to 10. San Fran gets a shot to come back and win under two minutes to play. But Jeff Wilson gets hit by P.J. Locke, fumbles the ball. Kareem Jackson recovers it for Denver. And that's your ball game. Broncos win it. 11 to 10. So here's a look at your local NFL connections today. Let's begin with the Bengals and Trey Flowers out of Judson. One solo tackle, one fumble recovery for the Lions. Josh Reynolds out of John Jay. Six receptions, 96 yards. Saints, Marcus Davenport out of Stevens. One solo tackle. Seahawks, Tariq Woolen out of UTSA. Four tackles, three solo, one interception, and one pass defense. And for the Broncos, Caden Stearns out of Steele. Four tackles, two solo tackles, and one pass defense. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. Who wins tomorrow night's showdown between Dallas and New York? Will it be the Cowboys or the Giants vote now. We'll have the results at the end of the broadcast tonight. When we return, San Antonio FC secures the top spot in the West. It's just, it's for me, it's just like we have such a specific style of play and we stick to it. And I don't know why that is looked down upon, but I don't really care too much because we're, we're, we're a really good team right now. And the culture that we have in that locker room is one that I've never seen before on a soccer team. SAFC has earned a playoff bye week thanks to Saturday's win. They'll have to keep sharp with three games to play if they want to secure home field advantage for the entire playoffs. Meanwhile, the Roadrunners got the big win over Texas Southern to improve to 2-2 two and two on the season, while the UIW Cardinals suffered their first loss of the year will also have the best of big game coverage 12 stop 12 and the Spurs going to be without Keldon Johnson for the start of training camp in the preseason is this a sign of what's to come for this year the sports guys decide when instant replay continues live next